the Outdoor Drive Podcast. All right. Welcome back to the podcast, episode 153. That's after 152, but before 154, I think would be 153. Um, before we take this thing across the pond, this is your boy, East Coast Trev, and... The English are coming. The English... Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is just Steve. I mean, they are. I mean, they are. <laughs> well, you can't say the British because I mean, they're not part of Britain anymore, but... Well, this is very true. This is very true. For you guys that don't know and haven't looked at the cover art or whatever the case may be, we have a good buddy of ours, Manny, from across the pond. Uh, you guys not only will get a chuckle, but he's... Very. This is a very fun podcast for us. Um, I got the chance to shake hands with Manny and meet him at the DSC. I'm glad I didn't podcast with him there because we were able to build some type of very good relationship before we ended up doing this podcast. And I feel as if all three of us have a very good relationship and it's only going to get better from here on out. And you guys will see why as the podcast tears on. But um it was definitely a fun one for sure. Oh, no um, doubt. It, it was, I think the best part was um, your limited experience with English mannerisms and culture and watching your reactions to some of the phrases and the statements just had me dying. <laughs> well, it's funny is that I, me personally, like, I don't have a problem with that because me as a person, I don't. But when you have it on a podcast, then I was like, whoa, hold on. Are, <laughs> is this legal? Are we allowed to do this? And me knowing Manny, I knew what was going to happen. I mean, listen, dude, if I could play the recording of what he sent me on WhatsApp uh, two days ago, oh, my Lord. <laughs> yeah, it's, and, and people don't realize that folks in the English culture are a little more loose. I mean, that that's the culture over there. And, and it was, it was, don't get me wrong, it's a blast. I'm familiar with it. Place. I've seen it. I, you know, it didn't You've shock me them. at all. But watching Trev's reactions during this, dude, it it had me grounded. I was like, this is great. So because I, it, well, we try, we try and be right. Like, we, yeah, yes, we swear we are explicit. But like that, like I don't know, it's that that mannerism, right? It's, but it's fun. It's so much fun. Many stories are by far some of the best stories and, when and, it comes to hunting yeah and, and just to clarify none of it's like so far out there you don't want to listen like trust me you want to listen you will laugh yes. if you're not familiar with it you are going to do the same thing as trev i promise you yes it's a great podcast the stories are great um you know shooting from cape buffalo to you know just you know, water deer, and he goes through the cultures of the hunting world over there to compared to in the States. So it's, it's definitely an amazing podcast and we can't thank Manny enough. And it will not be the last time that you hear from oh, Manny no, here on the podcast. Not. Um, there's actually like we had talked about maybe on the podcast, I don't remember, but like we might even go visit Manny or Manny might come visit us. Like he yeah. wanted to come over for hunt stock. And so it's a very good relationship and we love Manny dearly. Um, he's become quite the brother to us so oh, for we're sure. super excited so, speaking there, of go ahead oh, go ahead speaking of hunt stock guys we're a week away i mean literally a week away from hunt stock if you guys have not gotten your tickets your tickets yet you need to get your tickets use the promo code outdoor drive save yourself some uh it's not much but it's something uh, it's it's a little bit cheaper than what it is. There's one day passes and three day passes. We are going to be there, and I cannot emphasize the amount of giveaways that we are going to give away while we are there. I mean, it is nuts. We're and and guys, you guys that are supporters and listeners, uh, me and Stephen had a long talk yesterday about this. Is we want to also give back to you guys for what you guys do for us regularly every single week, and we are super thankful for you guys. And this is not all for Hunt Stock. Um, some of these giveaways we are going to give away at Hunt Stock, and those guys will be able to get in on it also. But for our diehard listeners, we are going to give back for you. We have Captain Steph Sport Fishing is giving away a five-hour trip, which is a value of six hundred and seventy-five dollars. Ducks on the Bay is doing their Ducks on the Bay uh, Sea Duck Hunt. We're also giving away, which is a thousand-dollar value. So now we're about close to two thousand dollars. That's for you to bring a friend with you for one day of hunting. Which, come on, it's just an amazing experience, and a lot of you guys don't get the chance to do that. Also, Latitude Saddles. Uh, we have Zeus Broadheads. There's going to be some Aries that we're giving away there. Um, 
Bow Hunting Magazine is giving away some stuff. Rack Brackets giving away some stuff. Nor'easter Game Calls is literally going through the entire line, from grunt calls to tube calls to pot calls to box calls. I mean, what he's sending down, I don't know. I, I don't even know how Mark has enough time to make all the stuff that he's made for us for this show. I mean, from card holders to hat racks to, I mean, he's just blown it out of proportion. I cannot thank him enough for everything that he does for us constantly. But there's going to be, what else? What else did I forget here? Oh, uh, Vital Grounds Outdoors, Matt. He's giving away mm-hmm. a bunch of stuff. Um, uh, what else? Who else do we got? Um I think that's close to every hunt stock. Yeah. I mean, uh, Huntworth. Huntworth. <laughs> He's given hunt a stock. full lightweight set of camo. Yep. Tops, bottoms, and hat. I mean, like, dude, there is so much stuff, thousands of dollars worth of stuff that we're going to give away there from, you know, if you guys aren't subscribed on, on YouTube, make sure that you're subscribed on YouTube. We might give away stuff there. You make sure that you're subscribed to on the Facebook page, uh, our Facebook group, The Outdoor Drive. Instagram. Make sure that you are following all of our social media platforms. Who knows where we're going to give something away? It's it's going to be one of probably one of the best shows. I, and, not, I'll, and I'll put it this way: so those of you that are subscribed on chosen platforms, we will randomly be going live on those platforms, doing giveaways for the people that are subscribed. Yeah, I mean, as simple as I might be giving away a hat on Facebook. I might be giving away a sticker on instagram like we might be giving away a cabin says sport fishing on tiktok you never know where we're gonna be we will definitely tell you on each platform where we're gonna be but you want to make sure to follow along there's gonna be certain times to get on over the weekend and just watch and be part of it because you might just win something big um and those for the hunt stock there's gonna be a couple things there if you're at hunt stock there is some exclusive stuff that's gonna be given away there also but there's just a ton of stuff that we're gonna give away um and hunt stock is going to be one of those things where there's a ton of great people there we're going to be podcasting we might be live on youtube while we're podcasting we might you know we might be live while we're out shooting the 3d shoot yeah there's a 3d shoot there i mean there's a ton of stuff program ever yeah i mean if you guys didn't hear that podcast get back to 151 yeah 151 150 yeah 150 150 and that and that podcast is all about hunt stock i mean it's we're really looking forward to it. Me and Steven finally get to do a show together. So it'll be very fun to have that and be there and podcast. And we're on the main stage on Saturday. We're on the main stage on Sunday. Um, it's just a ton of great stuff going on. And, and we hope to include everybody on all social media platforms and on the podcast. And you'll be able to hear the podcast also um, after we, we will release them on all of our uh, audio platforms also. But we'll do some live ones and just something cool and something different. We can't thank those guys for allowing us to be there and for all the sponsors that have helped us out and, and doing everything that they've done for us throughout the past. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So you guys don't miss out on it and uh, don't sleep on it, honestly, because you're going to miss out on some of the greatest times ever. I'll be honest. And as it grows, you know, we're, we're just happy to be there from day one. We, we, we are blessed in the opportunity to be there from day one. So, Oh yeah. And there, there's, really there's going to be some, some really cool, unique, unreleased content from some other people there. Um, I mean, come on, Hunt Suburbia, some of the stuff that he's glimpsing, saying I may release it, there is going to be epic. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's going to be. Larry Benoit's going to be there. I mean, there's a bunch yeah, of big names that are going to be there. It's fun. It's going to be a great time. I mean, they're super pumped. No brand ego, no none of that. It's literally just guys like us and we're all getting together to hang out and do our thing together a bunch of podcasters youtubers there's a ton of products out there wild edge um there's a couple other saddle companies e-bike companies i mean there's a mixture of everything that's there and it's the first year so so to see what this is going to blow up into is going to be something else honestly and you know um, we have exclusive hats that are going to be released there. Exclusive yeah. sticker. I mean, we got a ton of stuff. It, I'm so pumped about it. If you want to go to an outdoor show and walk through and check things out and at every booth not have somebody going, hey, sir, excuse me, have you seen this? Have you tried this? Is your knife sharp? <laughs> you, what do you do when you're in a tree? How do you? How are you safe? Can I polish your boots? Yes. <laughs> you, that's you want not, the chamois? <laughs> it's not going to exist your gutters? here. It's literally just walk through, enjoy. If you see a booth that's doing something cool, stop, check it out, 
I mean, it's just fun. It's going to be a chill, chill hangout spot. So it's we're looking forward to it. And all the boys are going to be there. You know, our whole crew is going to be there. Mike Salter is going to be up there. Steve Mardix is going to be there. So there, we'll there all be is able a to chance that booth. even Mike Salter may be doing a live news for your cruise on set with us on stage. Impressive. Just saying. Impressive. Can't wait. So one thing. Well, I, we was probably. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, before we get too deep into this, one thing I wanted to clarify, because units of measurement over there are different than here. And he references 40,000 hectares a couple of times. And to give you an idea of what a hectare is, so you understand, is two and a half acres per hectare. So 40,000 is actually close to 100,000 acres. Ah. And now he also talks weight, you know, some of the size of the deer, you know, the the, the saber tooth deer he's talking in kilograms and for people not familiar one kilogram is one or two and a quarter pounds pounds yeah so just keep that in mind as he's talking so you understand the vast size he's talking a kilo you sure a kilo is two and a yeah, half a kilo is 2.2 pounds 2.2 pounds okay yep. so two and a quarter yeah I was thinking something else. I was never a good drug dealer, so it wasn't a drug <laughs> dealer at Different kind of but... kilos. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the same kilo. Uh, same weight, but different purpose. <laughs> yeah, no, I just kidding. Uh, the difference between 2.2 and 2.25 on that will get you killed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, well, should we check in with our man, Mike Salter, get this news for the cruise? Yeah, See what's man, going on go in the world. Roll that over. Bringing you the news for the cruise is our good buddy, Mike Salter. Take it away, Mike. Hey everyone, let's we'll start this one off in Maryland where the DNR is now accepting applications for the 2022 Black Bear Hunt Lottery. Hunters can apply online or at one of the more than 250 hunting and fishing licensing agents across the state. And all applications will need to be submitted by August 31st. The fee for that application is $15 and is non-refundable. Uh, and this year, the season will run from October 24th to the 29th in Allegheny, Frederick, Garrett, and Washington counties. And for the first time this season, uh, the hunt does include a Saturday. Uh, that lottery will be held, the drawing will be held on September 7th for those that are applying, so good luck. Uh, now to Ohio, where the DNR and the National Shooting Sports Foundation are partnering to host a free range day at five public shooting ranges on August 20th. This is being held to allow folks to gain hands-on experience and instruction with firearms at no charge from certified ex instructors from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The ranges open for the event are Deer Creek Wildlife Area, Delaware Wildlife Area, Grand River Wildlife Area, Spring Valley Wildlife Area, and Woodbury Wildlife Area. On-site uh, staff at these ranges will provide equipment, ammo, ear and eye protection, uh, all at no charge. Uh, so another great opportunity to get out and shoot. Now to Alabama, where the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources is sponsoring a Becoming an Outdoors Woman workshop uh, at the 4-H Center near Columbiana uh, on October 7th to the 9th. The workshop is designed for women 18 years and older and offers hands-on instruction where participants can choose four um, courses from over 50 uh, that are available, including hunting, fishing, shooting sports, archery, ATV, and boat handling, uh, and map and compass, just to name a few. Registration is currently open for first-time participants and opens for those who have previously attended on August 8th. The registration fee is $275, which includes meals, lodging, program materials, and instruction. And a recreational hunting, fishing, or wildlife heritage license is required to participate in the workshop. Uh, for more information or to register, go to www.outdooralabama.com slash B-O-W. Now to Iowa and another great opportunity for youth hunters. The DNR is offering a youth waterfowl workshop to teach skills needed to hunt, field dress, and cook waterfowl. The workshop will be will have knowledge uh, and skills building sessions with hands-on learning, as well as live fire wing shooting. The workshop uh, will be held on August 27th from 2 to 7 p.m. at the Olufsen Shooting Range near Polk City. The workshop is for those eight years and older uh, and does cost $35, which includes a meal and a membership to Delta Waterfowl. Registration opens today, uh, and for more information and to register, go to https colon slash slash tinyurl.com slash bdckdvhj. So get on that before it fills up. 
Now to Idaho, where return, uh, returned non-resident game tags go on sale today. Uh, if a non-resident does not have a deer or elk tag, they may be able to purchase a first tag and possibly a second tag during this sale. Residents can also purchase a tag uh, for the non-resident quota as a second tag. Tags are available on a first-come, first-served basis at fishing game offices, licensed vendors, online at gooutdoorsidaho.com, or by calling 1-800-554-8685. So get those tags before they sell out. And now lastly to Oklahoma, where the Oklahoma Youth Hunting Program is looking for volunteers. The program is for youths 12 to 17 years old. This year, the program plans to enroll 60 youths who have never hunted and who do not come from a hunting family. The program is looking to train new mentors for the youths who will be paired with a mentor for the youth deer season from October 14th to the 16th. The program has a number of needs at each hunt location, including shooting instructors, cooks, guides, photographers, and experienced outdoors men and women to help during the hunts. The program provides food, lodging, hunting sites, guns, and ammo, uh, while the volunteers provide uh, their time and expertise to the youth hunters. Anyone interested in volunteering is urged to attend the first group meeting on August 13th from 2 to 7 p.m. in Mustang. Uh, those who are interested in taking part in this should email Daryl with two L's at N-O-B-L-I-T-T-O-I-L-A-N-D-G-A-S dot com or call 405-833-2112 for location information. So a great opportunity to help the youth out there. As always, if you have any news to send along to me, it would be greatly appreciated. Reach out to me at Mike Salter on Facebook or Bearded underscore Bowhunter21 on Instagram. And with that, enjoy the rest of your ride. Well, I mean, at least on the news for Cruz, he wasn't talking about our president building the wall. Oh, wait, you mean that wall he promised he'd never go another foot on? Well, he's not actually building a wall. He's just he's just filling in the holes. Yes, yes. Rhetoric. You know. Well, I'm glad that Mike didn't go down that path, but I sure as hell will. So, <laughs> <laughs> all is good. Uh, all is good. unapologetically American. Yeah. Well, good thing we don't have to be American for this one. Why don't we go across the pond and see our boy Manny? Let's do it, brother. Here we go. All right, we're back on the phone with the man Manish from across the big pond. What's up, buddy? How are you? I'm all good. I'm all good. I'm still sucking air, so I can't complain that my limbs still work. So everything's good. I can't really complain. That's a good blessing, huh? <laughs> uh, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Each day you wake up. Oh, yeah. I'm happy. Roll out of bed and get going. <laughs> well, then you get greeted by the greatest mustache we've ever had on the show. So that just well, gets it going again. It, it does indeed. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Uh, it, it's yeah it's a tickling implement yeah <laughs> <laughs> i like it i like it now you yeah. guys have, might have all heard manish's voice before because we he had done a little tiny recording um <laughs> he had sent to me on instagram because we when we had talked about doing a podcast together and then he did the intro and it was pretty funny so we might actually have you re re-record that for everybody so we can kind of use it on a show here and there because <laughs> it is yeah. absolutely priceless <laughs> No problems. I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. More than happy. <laughs> well, why don't we turn this key? Let's get this drive underway. Why don't you tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and what you do? So my name's my name's Manish Galabai. Um, all, all my buddies just call me Manny. So feel free to call me Manny. Um, I I was born and raised in London, in pretty much central London. Um, I now live in rural UK. I, I live in uh, Norfolk, which is a, a county in an area called East Anglia. Um, we have almost every single deer species in the UK in our county, apart from sicker deer. Um, so we, we have monstrous uh, red deer because they don't have to travel so far to, to feed. So they grow huge around here. Uh, fallow, good sized fallows, um, roe, muntjac, Chinese water deer, uh, just no seeker deer. That's crazy. That's insane. What, so that's like every every bucket list animal everyone over here has. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just go out back and do it. Yeah, it, yeah, literally, literally. I, I where, where I live, there's I have fields to the back, fields to the front. Um, there are a few muntjac floating around, but they prefer heavily wooded areas. Uh, but we've got a decent population of roe deer, which I kind of manage myself. Um, 
And yeah, actually, Trev, I sent you some pictures uh, and a short yes. video of of that monster roebuck I took uh, on the second of April. So our roebuck season starts on the first of April, and I spotted this guy in January. Uh, he was still in velvet, and I thought, yeah, well, he's looking promising. And I'd, I'd left this dude alone for like two or three years, and then yeah, once the once the velvet shed, I started rubbing my hands, thinking. Mm, You've spread your genetics, and now your time has come. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I absolutely love it. <laughs> I love it. It's it's just crazy because those deer are just so different than something that we're that we're so used to here. They're they're an incredible <clears throat> little animal. I mean, they're not like what is it? What is a head? Like how heavy is something like that? So a row a row buck, a good size row buck would. So dressed carcass with everything taken out will probably tip the scales at around about 20 kilograms. Okay. That's a good size roebuck. Uh, Muntjac and Chinese water deer, they average around about the 10 kg mark. Gotcha. But they're, good they're barbecue the size. size. Yeah, they're just, yeah. They're, they're good size. That's awesome. So where did your love for the outdoors and where did it all start for you, especially growing up in London? So it's a city. So you probably yeah. didn't do much hunting there. No. Well, so I, um, my family are, they're a family of tailors. Um, so my, my father used to work on Savile Row in London. Um, so you've, you've all probably seen Kingsman. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, the shop front in Kingsman, mm -hmm. that shop's actually called Huntsman. Oh. And there's a shop directly next door to there called Dijon Skinner, and my father used to work there. So, yeah, we, we're from a, a, a long line of, of tailors. And um, I think, really, my love for the outdoors came from the fact that I lived in a city. And I needed something which was a complete juxtaposition to a concrete jungle. I always yearned for just being out in the out in the outdoors really it's it, it's hard to i thought about this long and hard before coming on to the podcast and i just couldn't put it into words it's just one of those inner those inner drives that pushes you outdoors it's mm -hmm. i mean it's kind of like you i mean we've only just started but i'd like to bring up the subject of anti-hunting um and a lot of them, a lot of the anti-hunters sort of say, oh, but you choose to do that. I don't think we choose to do it. I think it's just an inner, an inner thing within us that probably harks back from when we lived in caves, that we go, we hunt, we eat what we hunt, and a nice skull for me is just a byproduct. Absolutely. And you've had a lot of problems with anti-hunters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Personally, and just within the UK, it's well, it's it's a whole different culture over there, you know. Because oh yeah, here on our side, you always hear that anywhere over there, it's kind of a pay to play game, like mm. a, a high gentleman's game. And hearing you kind of talk about it this way gives that a little different perspective. It maybe it's not all that way. No, it's not. So I um, I also do do wild fowling or water fowling, as you guys call it. Um, mm -hmm. That's another good thing about where I live. Um, just up the road from me, there's an area called the Wash, which is like a miniature Chesapeake Bay. Gotcha. Um, so when we get migratory birds coming over from Europe, they they tend to settle in the Wash quite a lot. So yeah, for for me, Norfolk is like a sportsman's paradise. It really is, and interesting like the the road that i live on there's only five houses on the road um two of us hold firearms it used to be three of us holding firearms but the other dude he passed away unfortunately and we're all quite pro field sports mm -hmm. so it's a lot of it does depend on on where you live well i mean i suppose it's like that in the states as well people in the city don't quite get it but right yeah you just said that you hold firearms. Is that because you're allowed to, or how do you, 
Uh, there's not like any yeah, restriction or something. The firearm restrictions like, and rules there are different than here. So yeah, yeah, they they are tighter than a crab's backside, um, <laughs> and I'm not sure a crab actually has an ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's tighter than that, then you're doing pretty well with the Yeah. <laughs> so in, in in a nutshell, the way the way the firearms regulations over here work is, um, you have to initially apply for either a shotgun license or a firearms license. They, they're two different licenses. A shotgun license is reasonably easily obtainable because um, you, in a nutshell, you have to provide good reason to want to possess firearms. It just, you can't sort of say, I'd like a shotgun for home defense because that's like, no, you can't have that. You've got a rolling pin and a big stick. Just use that. But, that's what you get <laughs> you know that, that's what you get um so you can't you can't really use a firearm for home defense or anything um but yeah so your shotgun license is is reasonably easy to get you've um yeah you, you can join like a clay pigeon shooting club and that will become your your good reason um firearms are a different kettle of fish um for that you you do need good reason uh, target shooting is one of them. Uh, deer control and vermin management is another one. Um, but yeah, you, yeah, you need you need really good reason so for it. So once you have that firearm license, can you obtain and own as many firearms as you want, or do you have to apply per and let them know what you have? Because I know yeah. like you have a lot of big calipers, obviously for hunting big games. So it's got to be a little yeah. bit tougher to have those. Yeah, yeah. So with um, so I'm I'm really lucky in that um, it it has been happening quite a lot recently that people are putting in for for firearms licenses. Uh, sorry for for larger caliber rifles, and then what happens is they buy them, and the rifle never leaves the UK. So then what ends up happening is the firearms inquiry officer or the FEO um, every five years they pop round and they visit you. So we have to renew our permits every five years. Uh, they pop round, they visit you, you sit down, you have a cup of tea, a couple of biscuits, very British, da, 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 and you have a nice <laughs> chin wag. And then you get to the nitty gritty. The guy does an arms check. Um, we check all the serial numbers are correct. Um, you're not holding anything you shouldn't be holding. Um, you're, so we have to keep our ammunition in a different safe to the firearms with shotgun shells i can just leave them around the house they don't really worry about them too much um but i, I suppose it's all to do with um lethality at range obviously a makes a, sense a, a, yeah a rifle is a, more, a lot more lethal to 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 a longer distance um but yeah Luckily for me, because I have been abroad and my father, it's great because when you when you leave the UK, the Home Office actually check your firearm out of the UK and they inform the police force. So that flags up straight away at the uh, at the firearms licensing unit as a little email. And then they go, oh, that rifle's left. And then when you come back, oh, the rifle's come back. Hmm. So then when you want to put in for another bigger caliber, it makes your argument a lot stronger because there's you can show that there's a history of you going there gotcha. and you've got a good reason. That's crazy. That's that's awesome because then you could say, well, I need a bigger caliber because I'm going to go to Africa to shoot Cape Buffalo. And that's probably the case. Yeah. When you, you had tell them I couldn't that, legally right? take it with the caliber Pretty. I took last time. So I need yeah, a bigger caliber. It etc man that's not well to be honest with you my first ever big rifle was a 375 hnh which is a beauty of a rifle it's definitely a one rifle you can travel the world you can if you home load which i do um you can load it down with like the 235 grains which will be perfect for practically any yeah any sort of deer species um and then you can load it all the way up to a 300 grain pill which will take anything that walks God's green earth, really, as long as you, you put the bullet in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, I am currently in the process, though, of having the 500 Jeffrey built. Ooh. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm, I'm fucked. Well, I mean, 
Trav, you you've met me. I'm not a I'm not a big guy. I'm only five foot three, and I think I weigh about sixty kilograms. So, yeah, firing that's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> does it you come with a, does it come with a kickstand you know you prop it up no it, it it doesn't it doesn't but the great thing is um on my firearms license so each each rifle will have a different condition um so my my 375 is conditioned for me to use in the uk on deer uh the 500 jeffrey isn't it's only conditioned to use on ranges which are you know adequately set up for for such calibers um but then it also says that before i use it i have to ensure that i have adequate insurance to financially compensate for any damage <laughs> to property or health wow <laughs> so what i'm yeah so what i'm gonna have to do is i'm gonna have to get some paperwork drawn up because buddies of mine are gonna want to have a go on it so I'll have to get paperwork drawn up saying, listen, if if your teeth rattle loose or any fillings fall out or it suddenly gives you a heart attack, I'm not held liable. And now my dog Gerald has just come in and he's <laughs> starting to chew the chair. <laughs> Good old Gerald. Gerald. Working dog. <laughs> what are you doing? Go on. So do you have big yeah. plans for taking any animals with your 500? Um, yeah, it's it's going to sort of become a dedicated buffalo gun. Um, so um, going back to talking about my my hunt from this year. So this year I went um, I went to a really awesome place um, in Limpopo. Uh, it was forty thousand hectares, so it's fairly large grounds. Um, mm-hmm. It is fenced, but you. We never saw the perimeter fence while we were there. I mean, that's right. that's a big chunk of land. That's no it is, joke. It is. Yeah. And it, it was great fun because we were dodging, like, they had rhino on the property and everything. Um, we'd, we'd see leopard prints. Never saw any leopards. But when you see leopard prints, your your butthole starts giving it a bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of huh? thing. They, <laughs> they, they, hide, they hide ridiculously well. They can hide in about a foot of grass and... They're they're a cat which will just pounce on you because just they can't because yeah. to kill yeah, you to yeah, kill you because, yeah. yeah that's it absolutely um, but yeah no and after taking my first cake buff I've it, it's kind of it it's kind of got me hooked on it really because. Mm-hmm. Planes game hunting for me, I liken it too much to deer stalking in the UK, where it's because it is a um, an animal that does sort of generally get hunted. They behave in much the same way, and I mean, when you look at muntjac and Chinese water deer, so muntjac uh, originated sort of in the Indian subcontinent area. Um, so out there, you've got big cats anyway. So they'll be getting hunted by them. They'll get hunted by humans. Um, and chasing them is great fun because they're a tiny little animal. Actually, I pre-prepared and I've got some skulls from, <laughs> from downstairs. <laughs> so here is a muntjac skull. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's, That's so, so cool. cool. So you've got these little fangs. Now, believe it or not, that inside edge is actually sharp. Um, when I boiled out this skull, I think I cut my thumb on on that on that tusk there. Really? And then obviously their antlers do grow a lot bigger than that. I've seen them out there before. Um, but yeah, quite a quite a quite a prehistoric um, deer almost. This second bit here that looks like a secondary eye socket is actually right. a, a huge gland that they use for scent marking. Um, but yeah, so. There's your there's your Chinese water deer. Uh, sorry, your your muntjac even. Funny little animal. It will sort of it'll be walking along in one direction, it'll stop, it will browse, and naturally you're thinking it will carry on going in that direction. No. They'll just go bump and they'll just they'll fuck off in another direction completely. And you think, well, I wasn't expecting that. But uh, yeah. That's a cool yeah. little animal. Everything or about that is it. different. <laughs> Now these, I, I nicknamed these um, saber-toothed swamp deer. Okay. 
Holy oh. cow. Wow. Oh. So obviously th- this 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 deer species is it really, really archaic because there's no there's not even any pedicles. It's just a smooth skull. So absolutely no antlers whatsoever, but what they have are these great big huge tusks. Um and these tusks actually sit. I'll try and get it in the camera. If you can see, there's a cavity just there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that cavity is actually a muscle. And what happens is when they fight, they flick the tusks out. They rear the heads up and then they bosh down on their opponent. And wow. once again, the insides are sharp. So then they... You, you you get some Chinese water deer which are cut up real bad, uh, really really badly cut up. The same evening I took this guy, I took um, another Chinese water deer that had. He was an old dude. He was really old. His ears were all chopped up and everything. He had one broken off tusk, and the other one was worn down. So he was really old. But that was that was all just done as part of the management plan. That's crazy. So that's that's kind of how you age them is from their big saber tooths. Um, <laughs> get not, not 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 necessarily. They um you can get you can get some younger Chinese water deer with quite long tusks. It's aging them's quite odd because it's only recently that the population's really exploded in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um but the problem is so Chinese uh, so um Munchak deer is an open season. There's there's no close season on bucks or does, uh, purely because they breed year round, and because they breed year round, they've been hugely successful. They we so the local town to me um, where where I do a lot of work. Oh, we missed that out. I'm a heating engineer, so I'm just a blue collar guy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> heating engineer, straight plumber type of thing <laughs> and um yeah so the the local town to me where where i do a lot of work um i can be um in the back of uh, a customer's house working on a on a heating boiler and next thing you know you look out the window and there's a muntjac in their garden eating their roses and then you're normal. in a town and that, that's quite normal yeah and then you'll get people that will feed them <laughs> Um, there's one little old lady that goes, oh, my friend's out there. And she'll go out with a, a handful of peanuts and the munch jack comes over and eats the peanuts out of her hand. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, straight up, straight up. And I just sort of think, damn, I wonder what that thing will taste like because it's been eating a diet of peanuts. It's going to be uh, very protein rich. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I bet yeah. you that it has a ton of marbling in the meat. Oh, I bet. <laughs> From the Ooh, peanuts and the protein. Mm. Yeah, now that could be, that could be interesting. Venison with marbling. Because yeah. believe it or not, Chinese water deer are actually quite a fatty deer. And the meat has got like a slight buttery kind of flavor to it. Okay. It's really nice. When, when other buddies of mine ask me, oh, what does Chinese water deer taste like? Oh, it's like sweet and sour. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> but it doesn't. Really, I don't, I don't. No, no, right. Of course. I, I, I'm trying to picture that flavor palette. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <In> a deer. <laughs> I mean, hey, it fits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, no, it's um, it ain't too bad. It's 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 good. It is good, but it's yeah. The the I think there was a there was a study done by the British Deer Society not that long ago, and they've they've basically declared that the the deer situation in the UK is at a critical stage in that there are just far too many of them. Um, nowadays, if you if you drive around rural roads, especially in Norfolk and Suffolk, which is the the county just to the south of me, you see a lot of roadkill, a lot, and it's wow. it's mainly muntjac. So they're basically becoming your guys' pig problem. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And 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 once again, you, we we get people going. Oh no, you can't kill them. You can't do this. Yeah, I get that. That's which everywhere. Leads That's right everywhere. back around full circle to the antis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm one. Only a theory, but I think the supermarkets have a big role to play with this because it's it's led to humans as a whole having a massive disconnect to where our food comes from agreed 100 percent. 
Absolutely. No question. Because, there. you know, we, we just see it packaged and there, and it's sort of semi-prepared. We just go, yeah, hey, this is where it comes from. But, yeah. Yeah, but we, we see that quite a bit over here, especially as of the last few years. Uh, you'll get a lot of the, the posts and things online where, they're saying, you know, why do you need to go kill a deer where you can just go to the grocery store where it's made? And you just kind of rub your head. And <laughs> like, are, are you guys so naive in this generation that you don't realize that that meat is not made at the grocery store? It, it's just like, come on. And you want to have an argument here? Yeah. I know, but you see, Steve, nowadays with, with, with the rise of um, veganism and vegetarianism, um, food can actually be well sorry fake meat can actually be made in a store but I, I can't get my head around that you either like bacon where do you two stand on bacon oh all, all day it's the best all day food that's in the a world. staple food here <laughs> thank god thank god i i normally gauge people by their love for bacon it's <laughs> Yeah. So if I, if I meet someone for the first time, go, so you know, it's sort of ten minutes into the conversation, and where do you stand on bacon? Uh, I'm not too sure about it. Do you do you not eat it for health reasons or religious reasons? Oh, religious reasons. All right, fair enough. I'll let you off. Gotcha. Or for health reasons, I'll let you off. Um, if it's just a case of, yeah, I just don't like it. Told me so, all you well, need to know. You, you, you need yeah, medication. No, I'm, yeah, I'm going. Goodbye. And then I just walk away. Like, That's great. No conversation needed. Here. No conversation. Like, no, 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 it's just... I so I want to talk about some of your Africa experiences because where when did you start going over to Africa and where did you find that love for it? Because you you've started to do a, a lot of it now. Yeah, so so with with Africa, my so my father came from British East Africa. So he emigrated from India to um, to Kenya, uh, chilled in Kenya for a long time, and then finally ended up in the UK. So I think my love for Africa kind of comes from my father, and Gerald has now got the power lead to my computer. Oh, you little <laughs> fucker! He's Lord. Oh, you little shit bag. Yeah, that's right. Get the fuck out. <laughs> you got to love God it. God damn it. <laughs> okay, well, there, there's some electrical work for me to do. How the hell did he not? Oh, that's how he didn't zap himself. It's only like 12 volts or something going, on, going through it. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's just little shit. He always does this. Whenever I'm on the phone to someone or I'm trying to concentrate, he'll come over and then he'll start nibbling and just, be a little prick. Um, sorry. How <laughs> how are good. we for cursing, by the way? Yeah, oh, you're good. fair game, man. <laughs> We're in the right oh, place. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> sorry, back here. to Africa. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, my father always used to sort of say, like him and some of his buddies, they'll just get get some beers, grab a rifle, and they'll they'll bugger off into the Serengeti or something, take some planes game, have a barbecue, and I always always heard about him and his friends and stuff they talk about it um and then i started deer stalking in the uk in about 2010 i think it was about 2010 and this was my first ever deer it's a little it's roebuck a deer. little roebuck and um, my my previous terrier <laughs> got a hold of it and chewed the shit out of it but he left you the um, antlers he left me the antlers i won't hold that against him because i loved that dog that dog helped helped me so he he helped me through a lot so yeah i'll just r.i.p toby but yeah <laughs> you can and, remember uh, him. he wanted you to remember him forever <laughs> yeah that's it and uh but yeah so it was i don't know it's quite strange really because so I, I used to be in the British services. I was, I was, I was in the, I was in the household cavalry. Um, so I, you know, I enlisted when I was eighteen, um, and then I left um, eight years later. Um, and then I had a, a short spell of not sort of being around firearms or anything. And then we moved to the countryside, and I thought, right, you know, now's the time. I, I joined a little target shooting club, um, punching holes in. 
a bit of paper at eight, nine hundred yards was sort of fairly, yeah, okay. I know I can do that. Yeah. Um, I should be able to do that. The British taxpayer paid a lot of money to ensure that I can do that. My little Terry has walked in now. <laughs> She's okay, though. She's old. She's like 11. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, and then you sort of start thinking, well, hold on. And that, that buzz of chasing something, I kind of need that back. And my, my partner actually said to me, she went, well, when we first got together, you never hunted. I said, no, I did. It was just a different species altogether. Yep. <laughs> Steve, you know what I mean. You oh, know, yeah. you, I know exactly what you mean. When, when you're out dangerous there, game. Yeah, that's it. But the great thing is because we're this, we're hunting ourselves effectively. Yep. We kind of know how we think and it, it kind of helps the game a little bit, but sometimes it makes it even more unpredictable. Um, so yeah, that, that need to sort of chase something came back. So then I started deer stalking in the UK. Um, as that progressed, I then thought, I need to give myself a bit more of a physical challenge here. Um, and I was looking into hunting uh, mid-Asian ibex in Kyrgyzstan, because okay. I thought that's, that's a solid two weeks of horse trekking at altitude, pulling difficult shots like cross valley shooting and all the rest of it. And I thought that's yeah. going to test, that's going to test all my skills as, as a soldier and yep. as a hunter. Um, so I started looking into that and whilst looking into that, I came across a wonderful forum called africahunting.com. Um, so I, I joined that forum and I was, I was sort of lurking for a long time. And then you start seeing the, the little deals come up and you think, you know, that's actually, that's affordable enough. I can do that. If I saved up for a couple of years, I could do that. And then I went out there and yeah, the, the bug took. That's incredible. So what did you take on your first journey over? So my first journey over, I took a, um, a blue wildebeest, um, an impala, a blesbuck, and an absolute hoss of a red hearted beast. Um, he actually made it into the Roland Ward book. Nice. Wow. So he, he was he was a good guy, and that yeah that was that was a very memorable shot because all that week oh and um, a jackal. Okay. Nice. But that's, you know, yeah. that, that's, you know, they're vermin effectively. So yep. yeah, I've, I've got, I've got to find out what a 250 grain bullet from a 375 does to a jackal. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yep. um, Pink mist. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, no, the, um, the red heart beast. So all, uh, yeah, the red heart beast. So all week long would sort of stalk in the position. I'd get on the sticks, the pH would go, okay, Manny, shoot. And then I'd, I'd just be there taking my time, just like, yeah, no, I'm all right. No, he ain't going anywhere. He ain't in a hurry. And then when I was ready, bang. And um, and there was just this running joke sort of going, you know, is Manny like a conservationist or something? Like he, Well, we're, we're all conservationists, but a conservationist in that he's, he's not shooting quickly enough. Right. Gotcha. So there was this running, there was this running joke that, yeah, you know, Manny can't shoot this, that, the other. He just sort of, he's taking his time, and um, and then when it came to the red hearted beast, we've been chasing this dude all day long, and I think by that point we'd racked up like twenty miles or something like that, just chasing him around on foot. My PH, who was vastly overweight, um, was just he was a physical wreck. He really was, but the outfitter kind of stepped in for the pH. And um, we got to within 120 yards of the group of red hearty beasts. And just as we did, so we were crawling along and I just felt the wind change slightly on the back of my ear. And with that, I just went, nah, -uh, not again. And I just sprung up like a jack in a box, raised my rifle and just went, boof. And the thing dropped. And then it was just a case of, <laughs> you've been hiding that all week. <laughs> so, yeah. Just need the right one. 
I just need the right one. I just need the right one. That's it. If if I don't have to do it, if I don't have to rush a shot, I'm not going to do it. Right. Which is smart. Especially just, over yeah. there. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, because if you if you lose an animal there, especially at last light, it's... It's a long yeah, night. It's a long night. It does become a long night. But so far, touch wood, um, all my kills have sort of been one-shot kills. Beautiful. Definitely. That's yeah. I, I, I sort of, I do stick by. Um, there's two little rules that I follow. Rule number one: I don't like shooting animals if they're eating, if they're in the middle of a meal. I don't know. I think it's it. I think that stems back to Indian culture. When people are eating, you don't disturb them. If like, let's say if I'm, I've just sat down for a meal and my mum calls me, I, I just say, "Mum, I'm I'm eating." I'll ring you back. Yeah, no worries, son. And then bang that's it it's 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 done and dusted um and i i think that probably stems from 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 indian culture where i don't like shooting things when while they're eating and the other thing is if i'm not 100 percent with the shot i just don't take it right and i think a lot of people should live by those things yeah I mean, at least definitely the second one, because it, a lot of people, you know, will rush shots. And I think that you make the right calls by by making a smart, precise shot and yeah. not and then you're not losing the animal at that point or you're not, you know, messing up or you're not in a rush. You know, you keep those you keep the breathing calm. You keep the heart calm. Now you're making a precise, perfect shot. Yeah, that's it. I think it, a lot of it also comes down to ethics. You, you, you want a nice, clean, ethical kill. Mm hmm. Um, cause yeah, it, it, I don't know. I, I, if, if I mess a dish up that I've cooked from an animal I've taken, I feel really bad because it's like, you know what? I went out, I took this thing's life and now I've not managed to do it justice. So I'll, I'll think quite a lot about how I'm going to cook, cook my deer. Um, funnily enough on Saturday, we had, um, we had our neighbors over and um, I did fillet of roebuck um, with with chimichurri, and damn, it was pretty good. It, it went down quite well. You did it justice. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now, when you were in Africa, then you started to go from the plains game to more of the dangerous type of game. Yeah. So it, it kind of. Um, there was there was a there was a little incident in 2019 which involved a um, a lion and uh, yeah and I, I think it probably saw me and thought oh there's a spicy little snack there I'll I'll have a piece of that and um, yeah it, it's it's quite disconcerting when a dark shape in the bush um, suddenly erupts out of the bush and comes running into you. Um, and then, you, yeah, you, you, your immediate instinct is, I've got a rifle in my hands. I'm going to raise that rifle, aim four inches under the thing's chin and pull the trigger. Um, but it was so close that the, the bullet actually had complete cup and core separation. Wow. So, so what happened? Take us back. You, you rushed right through that. I, I need to hear okay. the story from the beginning. <laughs> Gee, don't, don't do me like that, Manny. Come on. <laughs> so... There we were. It was a delightful morning, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So we, we we were we were chasing some sable, um, so a lovely sort of scimitar horned. Oh yeah, uh, black black. They're a stunning animal, um, and a, a, a chum of mine. He's he's a Brit, but lives in Zambia. Has got stunning stunning sable on his property but after the buffalo planes game has kind of i've lost interest in planes game unfortunately but anyway um so we were chasing um a small herd of uh, um of sable uh, a buddy of mine was hunting with me he's he's older than me i look at him as like my older brother um but he lives in vegas a uh, really nice guy actually very a, a really close friend mm -hmm. and um so I said, right, you know, you go first. So we get there, and next thing you know, it we sort of there's lion there anyway. So I said, look, I'll be tailing Charlie. I'll I'll check our six. So every time we stopped, I'd sort of be about fifteen feet behind them, 
checking parameters and everything. And yeah, as we got into position for the final shot taking part of the stalk, um, yeah, I was just stood there. You know, when you get that sneaky feeling, something's not quite right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Someone's watching. I got that weird feeling that something just wasn't quite right because there was there was an odd shape, and I've never seen a shape like that. And I thought, what the fuck is that? And yeah, just as I thought that, yeah, this this shape moved at me at a rapid rate of knots, and it. So, on my three seven five, I've got a um, an adjustable magnification scope. Minimum one and a half, maximum six. Close quarter work. I'll just dial it down to one and a half. The thing filled the scope. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, and then yeah, that kind of sort of changed everything for it, you. It, it, yeah, yeah. It ended in well for me. It ended in the correct way. It yeah. So it just um, come out the bush charging at you guys. Yeah, with no warning. That's 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 the thing. Because normally, so line line are a gentleman. They they will they will roar a warning first. Right. Then they'll do a mock charge. They'll run towards you and they'll they'll stop at about 15, 20 feet, giving it all. Um. Uh, my my father and my grandfather both actually said, with big cats, the best thing to do: stand your ground and shout back. And they'll run the other way. And they'll run, yeah, because or, you're suddenly you're suddenly no longer a prey animal. You you're now a predator. A predator, right? And then they go, shit. You know, what does this guy know? Does he know kung fu or something? I'm getting the hell out of it. <laughs> and they, they, they'll, they'll clear off. It, it does work. It, it, the only cat it doesn't work on is is leopard, um, from what what I've been told. Um, yeah, there ain't a whole lot works on a leopard. They're, they're just <laughs> leopard. Yeah, they're coming. That's they're whole, coming. That's a whole new beast of an animal. That's. Yeah, they're, they're kind of like redhead women. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to anybody whose wife's a redhead, but it takes a real man. So kudos to you, bro. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it, it, it yeah. Um, and then obviously there was, we, we could have just put it down to, so, well, we did. Um, Initially, we bit down to self defense, um, and then I got chatting to the to the property owner, and we then decided that what what I would do is forego my fee for the sable. I was going to ask. That was my yeah. next question. It's like, how and do then, you? Yeah. Yeah, and then sort of pluck a testicle off, yes. sell it, and then pay the remainder for to, to, to put it down as an export um and then getting getting that thing to the uk was just oh, i can imagine a nightmare an absolute nightmare and at the moment it's uh the the skin is on the salt since 2019 it's at my taxidermy's place in um in coventry and uh it, yeah we need to get them tanned but there's no tannery in the UK that will that, that can manage anything that big, right? <sighs> so we lined up a tannery in continental Europe. Brexit then happened, so we couldn't just fling things over on the same CITES permit. So we then need a CITES export from this side. We need a CITES importation on that side. It will then get transported. So fingers crossed that reminds me I need to email my guy in Germany and go, hey, what's happening? <laughs> People don't realize I want to wind back real quick because your export from Africa is where it gets expensive. That's where you get your trophy fees and you have to pay the government yeah. to, to get them out of that country. That's where yeah. the hunt itself is not. I mean, for a line is obviously expensive, but for a hunt for planes game is not overly expensive. Everyone says that it's, Oh, it's out of no, my no. realm. I can't afford it, but you can. It's when you start bringing trophies back home is yeah. where it gets expensive. Yeah. I think, I think that's where now, now what I'm going to do is. Um, so in terms of planes game, the only planes game I'm going to shoot or hunt actively even are really weird, wonky horned animals, which have got nothing to do with they, they've got no input into the into the genus anymore um they're so past it that they're going all weird and um 
I've actually got a a wonky horn blesbuck, which I need to go and pick up actually. And it was a U. She had one straight uh, one straight horn and one it sort of started off straight and then it just went off at 90 degrees. Oh. And I thought, how cool is that? It's not it's not a perfect specimen, but hey, uh, it'll, I'll kind of feel at home with it. Character. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and I sort of thought, no, I'll, I'll start with Plains Game. I'll start collecting the weird and wonderful. But other than that, I think back to the subject of your taxidermy and everything, if you sort of go at it with um, a view of almost like if, if, let's say, you went and you found and after a moose, I mean, what does a moose hunt set you back these days? Uh, about 10 grand, probably, in Newfoundland. Holy shit. Yeah, so that's that's six, almost six to ten, six to ten. Yeah, so that that's that's borderlining on Cape Buffalo money. Yeah, it's you know ten ten will get you a mediocre Cape Buffalo hunt. Thirteen US will get you something reasonably good. Um, but once again, if if you sort of look at it that way and go right, if let's say I go to Africa and focus purely on one or two or maybe three really good plains game animals then you could easily occupy your week with just chasing two or three really good animals. Um, your, your day rate's your day rate. Um, yeah, that's across the board. No matter that, what that's animal that's that across the board. Take. Yep. Yeah. And then obviously your trophy fees will be a lot less because you're not going, you're not, you're not stacking them up. Mm-hmm. Um, for me personally, the hunt means a bit more because you're, you're trying to focus on one or two species to uh, specifically and then your know, taxidermy bill is not going to be massive either because it's a couple of animals or just one animal if you if you if you go and just take a cape buff it's just right. one animal it's a bloody big animal but <laughs> now, <laughs> yes now, your most recent hunt was a cape buffalo was yeah. that your first cape buffalo my first ever cape buff and definitely not my last Take us through it, because I want to really hear about it. I mean, it's that's definitely an incredible animal, and you know that's like the end all be all for Africa. Like that's the unicorn. Everybody wants a Cape buffalo if you're in yeah. the dangerous game. It's that there's a reason behind it. It, it there's there, it's emotional highs and lows. Um, outside of outside of active combat, it's the only time you kind of get that that sense of intrepidation that something could drastically go wrong. Mm-hmm. Quickly. But very quickly. Yeah. When, when you, when you hear a small herd of Cape Buffalo coming, crashing towards you, it, it, it is a sound that it got my heart going again. And I thought, shit, it's been a long time since I have felt this emotion. And it's, it's a good emotion, right? but it's been a long time since I felt that sort of emotion. And, um, but yeah, so day one, we're all there. And uh, um, so my buddy who, who I was with um, during the lion incident, uh, we, we hunted Cape Buff again. Well, well we, hate, we hunted Cape Buff together, not again. Um, and uh, so he, he packed a 416 Ruger, um, the bag with his ammo did not make it. Oh. So he had rifle, no ammo. Can we find 416 Ruger ammo anywhere? No, no, no. especially Could not we there. Find di- no, exactly. Could we even find dice for it so we can stretch out some 375 Ruger and load it? No, no. Um, and this is when I said, You fool. You see, this is why I use ammo. I, I, I'll use a rifle where the ammo is readily available in Africa because when shit like that happens, you're covered. Um, so, what, what ended up happening was my buddy um, used my PH's 375. Mm-hmm. So, day one, we get up, we go out, we check zero, everyone's happy, um, and then off we go. We go our separate ways. And I'm, we're, we're bouncing along in the truck, and I, I turn around to my PH. And I go, Paulie, yeah, are you happy with the current situation? What, what do you mean by the current situation, eh? 
I'm trying to do a South African accent. It was which fucking might, perfect. Might, might come across as really bad. Yeah, Manny, yeah, man, was, that was perfect. Was great. I'll, I'll probably <laughs> I spent have a lot Ed, of time with them, and that was perfect. And <laughs> Ed, Ed Rovers and Foles will probably ring me in a bit, going, "Man, what were you doing? <laughs> He's just taking the piss out of us all." Yeah. Uh, but anyway, he, he was just like, "What do you mean by like the current situation?" And I said, "Well, the current situation as it stands is we're out after dangerous game. We only have one rifle, and that's in my hands." If you're happy with that, then hey, let's do this. If you're unhappy with it, let's let's RTB and make another plan. You know, we, we can we'll beg, borrow, and steal a large caliber rifle for yourself. And he said, No, I'm happy. Let's just go. Well, fair enough. So off we go. And literally uh within about an hour or so, uh we see the right hand side of a Cape Buffalo's head poking out of the bush. Um, and his head was down like that. And no word of a lie, from the boss onwards, so obviously th- these bits here will be referred to as the bosses, and then you've got the, you've got the curl. And as the boss ended and the curl began, because his head was so low, you can see the top of it. And it was about... Luckily, I've got a ruler. Yeah, there you go. So that's a foot. It was a little, no, it was about a foot wide. So you had these foot wide Ooh. things on top. Of, and and then we, we sort of backed the vehicle up a bit and sort of had a little chat and went, well, what we're going to do? Do you want to go after this guy? And I just said, dude, it's like day one and we're in like an hour and a half. What the hell? I'm here for ten days. What the fuck am I going to do for the rest of the time? You know, <laughs> and that's a go observe nature, I suppose. I mean, yeah, yeah we, the, but the property it was riddled with crocs. There were crocs fucking everywhere. We were hit eleven o'clock. We're chasing crocs off the road because they, they'd come out on they'd come out of the pools onto the road, and you drive up to them, they don't move. So you you, you hop out, throw stones at them, chase them off, and things like that. Yeah. Good fun, good fun. Um, <laughs> the most dangerous <laughs> reptiles in the world, and we're throwing rocks at them. That sounds like yeah, like or, or, or you get a slingshot and just ping, just hit them with slingshots. Um, that was, yeah, we had a lot of fun doing that actually, just to get them off the road. And uh, <laughs> but yeah, so we went okay. Well, let's 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 make a little plan. So we, we back the vehicle up, we disembark, load up. Um, and start moving in, but this thing just vanished. And you think to yourself, how the hell does an animal a little bit smaller than like we we get pickup trucks in the UK, but they're not they're not as big as your pickup trucks. Your pickup trucks are like two and a half times the size of ours. <laughs> yes. It's like they're on acid or something. Your pickup <laughs> trucks go to the gym and take steroids. Ours just ours are cardio pickup trucks. <laughs> well, they're they for just run. Like, they're they're like, skinny. They're like for men like you at five three, one hundred and sixty pounds. You know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you, have, say the, you say that. You say that. Yeah, I. <laughs> I nearly bought a um, a Dodge Ram in the UK. I nearly bought one, and then the, there was a small thing in me that just said, "No, it's just going to look stupid on my drive. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it alone." But anyway, and um, so yeah, you've you've got this animal which is the size of a large vehicle, weighing in at a couple of tons, and it just slinks away silently, and it just disappears. But the thing is, that side of the property was all quartz. So each time you walked, all you hear is. <laughs> Right. Even if you tread light and tiptoe, just wouldn't work. So that was in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we are ah, the afternoon. The tracker got onto a track of a herd and he was convinced that there was a big bull within this herd. And I kind of liked the idea of this challenge because now what you've got to do is it's not just a lone bull. It's a a bull in and amongst a herd. So your accuracy, your target acquisition, your selection of target, all of that comes into play. And I thought, yeah, I'm game for this. Let's go do this. So 
that afternoon we had lunch, had a little siesta and then headed off again. Um, and as we went off, the track has sort of gone, look, the, I can hear the herd and I'm thinking, well, I mean, my hearing's not bad, but I can't hear a thing. And he went, no, 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 they're just over there. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to go hook around there because if they smell me, they'll come hurtling this way towards you. And I thought, <laughs> right, what is this normal wrong? work in practice? Yeah. <laughs> is, is this normal work in practice? And he said, yeah, yeah, no, we do this all the time. Don't worry. So me and the PH, bearing in mind, we've just got one rifle with a now you have sticks. charging. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we've got, we've got the sticks, set them up. And I thought, no, nah, we're a little bit too exposed here. Let's just move a little further back into the bush. So I moved a little bit further back, bent a few twigs, created a bit of cover, mask our outlines and all the rest of it. And then you hear it. It starts off with like branches breaking and shit. And then you get the grunting. And then you get the hooves, the grunting, the branches breaking. And then you, you see them. And it is just this blur of black just going past you in a dust cloud and then they just they, they, they literally went past us probably about two meters in front of us holy just, cow boom, 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 boom. just off they went and um and then i just sort of went whoa um did you see the ball poorly and he went nope Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> just, just, just making sure. Just making sure. But there was there was a ball there because we bumped into that herd. Um, the next morning we bumped into that herd, and but the ball was still way too young. And you just okay. think, yeah, we can take him, but what's the point? He's still got his genetics to put in, um, and ideally, because I. Me and my buddy, both both of us, when it comes to buff, we both look for the same thing, which is age. Um, I don't, I don't chase size. I don't go at things with a measuring tape. I just want like the oldest, gnarliest, angriest, smartest animal. Because you don't get old in the bush without being smart. Mm -hmm. Especially there. <laughs> Especially there. Yeah. And so if you, you you're then pitting yourself up against a smarter animal. You know, you're on their turf and, you know, it, it's, yeah. But so, yeah, long story short, that guy, we went, yeah, he's too young. We'll leave him alone. Um, and then in the afternoon, we went out again and we're driving along and then suddenly spotted some really fresh tracks. And then we thought, okay, there's promise there. It's a good, deep, heavy track which will indicate an older animal. He's dragging his feet a bit, indicates he's relaxed. Right, let's go for it. So we, we disembark, we go around, we walk into the bush, and then out of nowhere, I just saw like this back leg, great big, huge thing. And, well, I think that's him over there. Yeah, yeah, no, that's him. So we get into position, nice and quiet. It was still as well. There wasn't any wind, which was just beautiful. It was hot, but it was beautiful because there was no wind and got onto the sticks, but we couldn't confirm. Everything was pointing towards it being an old sing. Well, he was on his own. So straight away, he's, 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 a, he's a bull that's gone past his breeding prime. He's been kicked out of the herd. Now he's just wandering around on his own. He's all angry and everything because his nuts are full and he's not getting to empty them on a regular basis. So he's angry. Um, <laughs> we all get like that. Yep. <laughs> so we're on to him. We're on the sticks. I must have been on them sticks for about 40 minutes. But ev everything indicated he had like um, graying patches around his shoulder, hair missing, um, a great big dewlap, uh, a good deep drop, uh, worn down tips, a slightly white whitening around the nose. And the only, the final piece of the jigsaw, which is the bosses, because you're looking for really hard, solid bosses, we couldn't positively confirm that he was a hard boss ball. And then the wind twisted, 
and he took off. He didn't even turn to look at us. He just took off. He was just like, no, fuck this. I'm out yep. of here. I don't need to know what it is. I just know I don't yeah, want it. I just, I just want to get out of here. I can't see it. I can smell it, but I can't see it. So I'm getting the fuck out of here. Yeah. So off he went. Um, so we go back to camp. Uh, all this time, my buddy's still not even seen a buffalo. <laughs> Oh, it, man. It's 40,000 hectares. It's a lot of ground. It is a lot of ground. And we're both after the same thing. We're both after an old, solid, bossed, gnarly old thing. Ideally, what I was looking for was something with a busted horn. Because that's, for me, that would just be the ultimate thing. You, you get you get these buffaloes. They refer to them as scrum caps. Because over the years, they've just fought so much that their, their horns actually snap off. And all they've got left is this little big bosses. Hat. They just it, it just looks like a hat of horn and they, two they, hard butt cheeks on top of his head. Yeah, <laughs> it is literally that. Yeah, two hard butt cheeks. Yeah, that if you slap, they ain't gonna wiggle. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's no ripple effect on them. Do you really want to get that close to find out? <laughs> I think once he's on the ground, I'll give it a yes. whirl. Yes. But while it's alive, no, no. 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 That's no, a heavy no, no. animal to be messing around with. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, yeah, so all the so on day two, uh, my buddy had to do a barefoot stalk. Yeah, so our our PH outfitter said, bring some spare laces. And I'm thinking, fuck yeah, river crossing. And then when I actually saw the river, I went, no, I'm not crossing that. It's infested with crocs. Yeah. Um, Especially if they're on the road. <laughs> yeah. You know they're yeah. in the creek. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And um, so that's what it was for. You, you took your boots off, you tied them around your neck, took your socks off. So that quartz that I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of really good buffalo there, but they're there for a reason. It's noisy. It's loud. It's really loud. They can get through and not make a sound. We can't, a truck can't. So the minute you're on that ground, they know and they just disappear. That's nuts. Yeah, well, that's so my smart. Buddy, that's how smart they are. That's that's how they get old. Mm-hmm. You don't get we, we just mentioned it, you don't get old by being stupid. And um mind you, some humans managed to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately. <laughs> that's just luck of the draw. Yeah, yeah. And uh but yeah, so off we went and um yeah, so anyway, so my buddy comes back and he's just, he's just gone, Hey Manny, yeah, bro. Did did Paulie make you take your shoes off? No. And then he's looked at his PH and has gone, see, motherfucker, you make me <laughs> I'll tell you what, bless him. He he had thorns and all sorts of shit stuck in his feet, and was, oh. it was just like he was he was spitting feathers about that for like three days. Because then the next day he had to do another barefooter, but he kept his socks on this time. But then he wow. picked up loads of bits of quartz. So when he put his boots on, he had fucking stones I'll in just it. Stick yeah. him, yeah. That'll do it. <laughs> And I, sh- I shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't laugh because I love the guy dearly. Uh, but anyway, and um, so, yeah, so that was the end of day two. And then day three, nice early morning, off we go. There was, a, there's, there was this dried up riverbed there, um, but there were, there were still pools of water here and there. And, hey, guess what those pools of water had? Crocodiles. Crocs, little, little fuckers, and a few bigger ones as well. But, you know... Mean little ones. enough to, yeah, little <laughs> enough to cause some injury, but little enough once again to just sort of grab and go, get the fuck off, and I don't know, stick a stick <laughs> up at them, barbecue us, I don't know, but yeah, and um, so we we get to this dried up riverbed, and the trackers look down and gone, yeah, no, there's a good track there, okay, let's move, so we disembark, we load up, and we, we start following these tracks, and we followed them for a good ten miles. And then the track just ran out, just disappeared. Huh. It's like, are we, how, how, well, what the fuck, how, how did that happen? It's a big animal. It went that way. And then the track just vanishes. And then it's like, are, are we chasing some sort of flipping mythical animal here? Or is it, is it a ghost? I mean, you know, you just don't know. Um, 
which is Sword very trophies. surprising with those trackers because they can literally find anything. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. yeah. Aliens. He, mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <this. laughs> Only other way you can explain it. <laughs> Someone's going to get a probing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I got a feeling it's not going to go. They wanted. <laughs> no, <I'm all> <laughs> <laughs> there will be probing, but it won't be happening to the Buffalo. <laughs> no, no. Oh, <sighs> but yeah, no. So he, so the tracker was convinced that what happened was the, the animal, well, where, where the track sort of stopped, there was a, a few rocks. So he was convinced that it's gone over the rocks. So we, we went that way. We started following the rocks and then we saw like one, maybe two tracks, and then there was more rocks, and then it started getting hotter and hotter. So we just went, you know what? This dude, we're, we're about, we're probably about an hour, an hour and a half behind him. Um, so let's just leave him alone. He's, it's hot now. He's probably sat up somewhere. Let's just leave him. We'll, we'll come back in the afternoon. We know roughly where he is. So we... We then go off, have lunch, head back. We're driving along the tracks. And then out of nowhere, there he is. He's just stood there under a tree on a little island in the middle of the dry riverbed. Huh. And, and the driver is he's clicking his fingers. He goes, Manny, look, look. And I said, Nico, keep fucking driving. That's the same dude from day one. He knows the sound of a vehicle when it stops. Right, here's what we're going to do, gents. We're going to keep moving along. Nico, drop it into first gear. Take your foot off the gas. We're just going to roll along. Right, we're going to disembark the vehicle while it's moving. Don't worry about loading up. I'll get loaded up. We're fine. Uh, we man it Now we've got a 458 lot as well. The, the farm owner loaned us a 458 lot. Nice. So now I'm feeling a lot more happy about the situation. <laughs> and the PH has just looked at me like, Fucking what? We're jumping off a moving vehicle. If you break your ankle, I was like, no, 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 don't worry. I've, I've jumped out of moving yeah, vehicles and they're moving a lot quicker than this. <laughs> yep. This is all right. This, yeah, this is like normal working practice this year. Tuck and roll. Let's, let's tuck just and go. Roll. <laughs> yeah, tuck and roll. Absolutely. Yeah, tuck and roll. So we, we're all jumping off. The vehicle carried on going. And this buff looked in the direction of the vehicle. Yep. And we're like, yeah, here's our guy. And then wind wasn't in our favor so we got ourselves into a nice favorable position got the sticks out circa 45 to 50 yards away but now what he's done is he's tucked himself behind a great big leadwood tree which is solid they call it leadwood because it is like lead lead right um and it weighs a ton as well um so we're there we're on the sticks starting getting harassed by flies now i'm thinking oh fuck I'm, I'm focus focus next thing you know i hear a swarm of bees welcome to africa <laughs> welcome to africa but the, the the worst thing is in africa like, everything wants to kill you or hurt you or maim you or even the plants have got massive thorns on them that just cut your arm open and then you get septicemia and shit like that um but yeah, so the swarm of beans, in my head, I'm thinking, you know what? The way my luck is, if it was like raining hot chicks, I'd get the one that's pregnant with twins on psych meds, but she ain't taking her meds. <laughs> that's, that's how shit my luck is sometimes. Uh, uh. So, so I, I just sort of thought, oh, fuck, I know what's going to happen. These, these bees are going to swarm around me and they're going to, Fucking, they're gonna make a nest in my tash or something like that. And um, but they didn't, they just buzzed straight over and off they went. And now this dude has gingerly walked out, and then the the wind just turned, like the pH has gone right, Manny, whenever you are. So I sort of well, whenever you're ready. So I said a little prayer in my head in my head, disengage the safety catch. Just as I did that, the wind changed ever so slightly but this dude now instead of running his turn and faced us but as he turned and faced us his legs just picked up a wee bit and that was a green light for me and i just let drive straight between his legs boom pff, hit him right between the legs and then he took off reload 
fired the second shot. I gave him about three feet of lead, but I hit him in the back leg. Uh -huh. So I need to give him mental note next time when a Cape Buffalo takes off, give him an entire Buffalo's length lead. And you should move that fast. They move that quick. They, they, they go from like naught to, I think it's like 60 kilometers an hour God. in like 0 0.1 of a second or two or three. They, 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 they accelerate they're stupid fast. And they're, yeah. and they're a couple tons and they're moving. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's like, like, like we were saying, you, you don't, you don't get, you don't get to live that long if you're, if you're dumb and slow. Right. Um, but yeah. And then, so I've, I've reloaded safety catch on and I took off like a gazelle was fucking, ah, running in there. Um, and all five foot left, three, right? And there's I no one around, it. yeah. Well, fuck. Oh, it, it. <laughs> so in, in, in my target shooting club, um, we used to do this thing called civilian service rifle, which is it's shit. I don't do it anymore. Um, but in it, there's there's a section, there's a principle where you, you're lying down, they sound a hooter. And then you, you you spring up, you grab your rifle, and you sprint to the hundred yard uh, line from three hundred. So it's like a two hundred yard dash. And then once you get there, um, the target presents itself, and standing, you just engage it at a hundred yards. Um, I thought that once you get there, the target presents itself, and it's done on accuracy and time. So the hooter went. I jumped up, grabbed my rifle. I took off like a rocket. Got there. <sighs> Took a top, couple of really big deep breaths, raised my rifle. Nope, a couple of more deep breaths, raised my rifle, and I went, <laughs> and then I just called out. I went, leg six ready. <laughs> Say again, leg six ready. Get that fucking target up. <laughs> and then and then my safety supervisor, who is a buddy of mine, his next to me is going, hey, hey, mate, you've got 90 seconds to do that. There was no need to go that fast. <laughs> But after that, my nickname became the Bangalore Torpedo. <laughs> a, because I'm Indian, and B, I work like a torpedo. But anyway, so back to Africa. So I've shot off like a torpedo. Check left, check right. Shit, where are my running men? Where, where my pH? Where's my pH? Where, where's, where's the tracker? And the tracker wasn't too far behind me. I just saw him in my periphery. And then my tracker came in. Now, Vusi spoke no English. Um, as we got closer to, so I reckon, so I hit him at 50 yards. He must have ran another 50 or 60 yards. And then when we got to him, he was on the deck giving it this and just doing like a death bellow. They kind of go like that. They'll give a weird little death bellow. And I thought, well, that's him kind of dead, as far as I'm concerned. And then Vusi's like, and then his 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 pointing at his chest is going, hit, hit, hit him hit, again. Hit him again. So I then sort of got myself into a nice little position from about, because I knew that none of his feet were on the ground. And I thought, and I can see poorly coming along. So I thought, right, I feel comfortable to get a little closer. So I got to within sort of about 10 yards. And I just started lighting him up. It was just boom, reload, boom, reload. And by the time I've gotten, so now we're on my fifth and final shot. Um, Paulie's come along. So safety catch was on. And then he said, right, we need to now go round the back of him and just fire an anchoring shot into the top of his spine. Went round, fired a final anchoring shot into the top of his spine. So all that does is, obviously it severs the, the nervous system. So that sort of, even if he is still alive a little bit, he ain't getting up. Right. Right. Um, and yeah, then opened up, bombed my mag back up. And it was a case of, right, let's check if he's dead or not. And Vusi, I like the tracker. I like the way he checked if it was dead or not. He got my shooting sticks and gently stroked his testicles. <laughs> That'll do it. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. And then he tapped, he tapped his ball sack. There was still no mo movement, and then it, it's like a full-on, like a like a baseball batter, just 
Bumpf! <laughs> Cracked him in the nuts. It was like, yeah, now nah, he's done. Now you can celebrate. <laughs> now you can. Get, thinking about it, it makes sense because in my head, I was thinking, I don't know what I'll do. I'll go around and I'll tap his eyeball with the end of my muzzle. But now you're on the front end of him. This is it. So if he's still alive and he takes off, you're he's in coming right for you. Yeah, yeah. They are so smart over there when it comes to that. Like, we should definitely take lessons from them. There is no doubt about yeah, it. That's like, hundreds and thousands of years of people being trampled, and they finally went, ah, I did. This is how we do it. <laughs> this is it's, it. Guys, I'm just going to quickly flick a light on. Oh, you're yeah. good. Yep. It's getting dark over there. The sun's going down. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of strange. We're recording oh, at we 3 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> Sort of, oh, we can see you again. <laughs> you can see me now. Yeah, the, it's for lovely. a moment there was it was just a smile, and two <laughs> eyeballs. <It's> just, <laughs> Crazy man. Oh. So, so was it? Now that bull, that was the big mature bull that you wanted, and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he he was perfect. He he. So that 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 big bull we saw on day one. Mm -hmm. That was him. That was him. And awesome. he, he had big bosses on him. How big were the? Because that's how well, they measure the boss. How they measure him by the boss, right? Yeah. I don't. I don't know. They, yeah. they were like. Just they giant. Were, they were just. They were, they were, you know, like um, right. If if you're out and about and you see like a really nice, a really nice floaty pair of boobies, and you're just thinking, oh, I just want to, yeah. Kind of like that, like <laughs> just <laughs> sort of, yeah, yeah. You know what you I just mean. Just want to cup them. You, you just, yeah, 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 yeah. You just, you just want to sort of. I'll say it. Nestle up in them and be quite comfortable. And <laughs> um, I'm at a real advantage there, being short. Like most boobs are eye level for me. So. <laughs> Manny. That's oh. what he's doing. I could see him in the African bush with his head nestled down on the bosses of the, of the Cape Buffalo. Oh, that's the right size. <laughs> like, oh. No, no, I just need it. I think some more cleavage would do next time. <laughs> Yeah, but don't motorboat those. You may break your nose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way. Uh, That's yeah. incredible. No, it, it was – so I made um, – so obviously if you, if you look at some Cape Buffalo, they'll, they'll have like scarring on their bosses. Mm -hmm. And what that's – it's actually – it is physical scarring. So when they're soft bossed and they're young, they get really itchy. So they'll go up to a, a tree and scratch their bosses and they'll obviously they'll get cuts. The cuts can then get infected. You then get parasites and you get these little birds called oxpeckers. They'll come along and give you a little clear up and all the rest of it. But yeah, the, this, yeah, the bosses are, are gnarly and big as well. Um, not like the perfect boob because if, Boob was gnarly, then that's just bad news. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, what I like to call a good representative trophy, which it's, is perfect. Which is perfect. It's mm -hmm. it's it's like I said earlier. I I don't I don't chase things with a measuring tape. It's right. just it's it, if if the experience of the hunt has been memorable and emotional. I'm happy. If jumping out of a vehicle while the vehicle is still moving is not an adrenaline driven hunt and it's not memorable, that's probably not the right hunt for you then. Dude, it was going at five miles an hour. It was, it was hardly, it, it was hardly it's... like, it was hardly Tom Cruise's mission impossible, like jumping out, rolling. And then <laughs> I can see it 25 miles an hour down the road. Little Manny jumps out, rolls, <laughs> just rolls over, pop. Got it. <laughs> That's now, all I could my imagine. question is, is who had to go chase the car down oh no the car so so um nico the driver he sort of he went he went trundling along funnily gotcha. enough before before it all kicked off he stopped up and actually saw a um a leopard really yeah he saw a leopard and when he came back he said hey guys guess what you know when i stopped i saw a leopard and then I knew 
that everything was going to be fine. I don't know. Okay. And then, but he he did say that when he when he came back, he was like, oh, good shooting, Manny. Paulie, good shooting. And then Paulie just went, this is all Manny's work. I didn't pull the trigger. And then there was this whole thing of, well, how quickly can you cycle a bolt? And that's, very quickly. Well, I don't know. Yeah, if your life depends on it, you're gonna you're gonna move that thing pretty quick. That's uh, a that's yeah. a instinctual thing when it comes to that. All of us sportsmen have like think yeah. in the I mean, right situation. You've done it so many times, the muscle memory, you, you just you act. You don't think. Yeah. 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 That's it. I'd, to be honest with you, I actually engaged an old World War II method, which was the mad minute, mm-hmm. the three hundred three. Okay. And what they what they do is you'd reload. So you keep that section of your hand available to to grab the bolt, and you'd actually pull the trigger with that finger. Oh. So it's just close it, bang, open, close, bang. So it was just pop, 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 pop. Wow. Um, but I, I think the Germans actually thought that the Brits had semi-automatic rifles at one point. Because they were they were doing well, it so that fast. fast they yeah, can yeah. I'm gonna to have to practice that. I got a 303 British from that era. I'll have to give yeah. it a shot. <laughs> what is it? Uh, is it is it the short magazine the Enfield? Has it got like a stub nose? Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yeah. Snap, I got one as well. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There Good was rifle. uh I found uh, we had one of the houses that we had bought, there was a, a veteran that had lived there and he had inquired it somehow and he they were putting him in the VA and he needed to get rid of some of his guns and we inquired a couple of them. That was one of them. I had no idea what it was. So yeah, I just want to shoot it. A couple of, a friend of mine gave me a couple of boxes of ammo and he said, just shoot it. They're fun. They're fun to shoot. It's something different. And it's from a different time era and there's nothing yeah. you can do to it. So just shoot it and have fun with it. So yeah. Yeah. That, that, they're not, you can do a whole load of weird things to accurize them. Mm-hmm. Um, but my tip is don't bother. Just shoot it. Just shoot it and enjoy it. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah, they 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 are fun rifles, they really are. But yeah, so I just I engaged that thing Mad Minute style, and uh, yeah, just just that's yeah. incredible. Are you looking forward to Lit your next Cape Buffalo hunt? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much. Because because hopefully, so um, I had a chat with my gunsmith, and he said the five hundred should be ready round about Christmas time. Oh, fantastic! So you'll so, be able to take it on the next adventure. Yeah, yeah, I've got to, um, I've got to load some ammo up for that first. It's, uh, yeah. Well, Manny, it's getting to that time, man. Why don't, why don't you tell us what drives you outdoors? Oh shit! <laughs> I know you know. <laughs> I mean, come on, Manny. Well, he tried to get into it earlier, but <laughs> yeah, I, I think yeah. No, go, going back to Steve, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, yeah, going back to it earlier, it is for me. It's it's always been a primal thing. Yeah. It's, it is literally like it's drilled into me. There's something hardwired that makes me want to go outside and just enjoy the outdoors. You know, it's like it, nine times out of 10, when I go, when I go wildfowling, so I'll get up before anyone else is up. I'll, I'll get into a freezing cold old vehicle and I'll, uh, which is an old 1992 diesel Range Rover. That's what drives me outdoors. But. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Quite literally. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I'll get into that and I'll, I'll drive off and then I might meet a buddy there or you might not. And then you, you, you walk miles and miles and miles onto the foreshore and you sit yourself down. Nothing's up yet. And then you'll start getting little reed buntings just chattering away and they'll fly like right past you because you've been there since since before sunrise so they just think ah it's just something the tide has washed in we'll just fly around it <laughs> you just sit there and then you can see the pink foot geese in the distance and they're like yeah any minute now they'll start taking off and then they take off and then they just decide that they're going to fly a completely different flight path and they're going to fly 200 yards to the right of you <laughs> so you don't so you wake up, you go out, you do all that shit, you don't even get to fire a shot. But hey, you know what? I've got to see the world come to life in the morning. Mm-hmm. And it's it's that sort of yeah, you you're happy that you can do that. You're in a, a beautiful place where you can do that. You feel blessed to still be alive. 
Um, and then, yeah, I mean, Steve, you're a veteran, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yeah. So you, I mean, I'm not sure if you've been in any sort of really ropey situations where you sort of think, oh shit. Oh right? yeah. 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 So I, you, I you gotta know, go you, play over in the same sand as you. <laughs> yeah, this is it. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it, it's, it, it's, you, it, it gives you another, another way of thinking that, you know what, I'm still alive. I'm pleased because a lot of people didn't make it back. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it's like, I mean, and then obviously aunties, they, they, they will go at it with this angle of, oh, but you choose to do it. Okay, fine. Um, let, let's, uh, let's, let, let's take, let, let's take homosexuality for, for example. Okay. So there, there's obviously this debate about, is it nurture or is it nature? And things are now definitely going towards the the side of its nature. You, you you're born that way. I genuinely believe that hunters are just born to hunt. Mm-hmm. I, I, that, that's how I, that, that's how I think. It, it's you know it, it's like um, what well, one of the good things about my area is there are still a lot of elderly men who used to hunt, shoot, and fish like it was going out of fashion. That's how they used to feed their families a long time ago around here. Right, same here. And when when I go to their houses, you know you've walked into a sportsman's house just by what's on the wall. There'll there'll always be like loads of pictures of Labradors and, you know, foreshore pictures and things like that. And then you just, you get talking to them. And then they'll say, so do you shoot? Go, yeah, no, I do. And you'll get talking and... It's funny that they they would they would have waterfowled in the same place as I go, and that was years ago. Mm-hmm. And yeah, but they you can see it in them that if they if they were still physically able to do it, they would still be doing it. Correct. It's just that it's just that physical inability that has made them not do it. It's such a sad thing to see also yeah. because you know that it that that end is coming for you also. And how do mm. you get rid of that? Like how do you just stop doing it? We see a lot of old timers fishing. And they're like, I haven't fished in five or ten years. I just physically can't do it anymore. And you're like, if that ever happens to me, I don't know what I would do. Like how is he like how does he live still, you know? Because you have that drive and that love and that Yeah. Drive. Yeah. I think I think when if and when that happens, um, hopefully it doesn't touch wood, um, but age comes to us all eventually. Um, well, one of the beauties is in the UK, um, if you're really lucky, you can get onto um, a large estate um, where they do have a deer problem. Oh. And a lot of the deer control will be done off high seats or tree stands. Mm-hmm. So, and they... They will if if you're a good enough shot and you've you've been there for a number of years and you know the head keeper knows how you work and they're happy with how you work, they'll actually get a trainee gamekeeper to drive you to the tree stand, and then as long as you can get your ass up there, <laughs> you're okay. Because then to 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 stay safe, so let's say you get invited to a cull evening, there'll be like 10, 15 people on on an estate. And until the ve- until last light and a vehicle comes along, you do not disembark that tree stand. You stay up there because we don't wear orange here. Okay. Because um, we're well, we're not so trigger happy. No offense, guys. But... Yeah. <laughs> oh, none taken. I don't deny <laughs> it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, because we don't we don't have public public land or anything right. like that here. It's mm-hmm. it's it's very it's quite restrictive, but that's part of that has led to the explosion in, in deer population. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah. So sorry, going back to the question, what drives me outdoors? It's, it's, uh, it's an inner, it's an inner force. That's crazy. I love it. I love it. No, it's so true. It's it's an inner force. It's It's just an inner force. It's, it's, it's that thing that says, you know, yeah, it's windy. It's raining. Hey, you know what that means? The ducks are going to be flying low. You can, you might actually hit one. Get your ass out there. 
<laughs> it, it's kind of crazy because that's probably the best explanation of what drives you outdoors. Like we have so many different answers. And I think that that one hits the nail on the head. 110% is what it is. It's that, it's that inferior inside of you that you want to go out and, and mm. do it, you know, and truly yeah. is. Yeah. It truly honestly is. Yeah. And, and, and plus, I mean, getting, getting to share, I'm, I'm going to sound a bit biblical now, but getting to share nature's bounty with your friends. Mm-hmm with your friends and family that, that for me, it, you know, it's crazy because even going and it makes so it, it's even you living across the pond, what got us together is the outdoors. And yeah, it, this you know, is went it. away yeah. because we were both at an outdoor convention and you living in UK and me in United States, we became friends. Now you're friends with Steven. You're, you know what I'm saying? And it's all the outdoors. So now you're embarking and sharing that with everybody you know, we're friends on Instagram. You see what we do. Yeah. We see what you do. Now we're still sharing the same exact passion and we live on two sides of the world. Yeah. It's an incredible yeah, thing. It, it really is. That's, that, that's, that's the beauty of it. It's, it's a common interest and it brings us all together. Mm -hmm. um, talking of which, I think one, one of the, one of the slight problems we have in the UK is there is a division within the shooting community. Um, like, so uh, driven game shooting, it's not my cup of tea. Right. But I understand how it has a place in conservation and how it brings much needed money to rural economies and all the rest of it. And I will go on a driven game shoot to drive the birds because it's, it's, it's great fun socially as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a good day out in the field with buddies. Mm -hmm. Um, would I shoot in one? Probably not, because it's just not my cup of tea, like I said. But if if an ante was attacking it, I'll back it up. 100. Yep. Because at the end of the day, it's still shooting. And just like that, you, you'll get target shooters in the UK. Could never squeeze a trigger on a live animal. But they will happily attack hunters. And you still think, whoa, hold on a minute. We're mm -hmm. all part of the same club here. We're all firearm license holders. If they do away with hunting, they're coming for your asses next, and they'll start taking away your target rifles. Yep. You bring up a very valid point because I think, you know, the anti-hunters are a problem when they attack the outdoor community as a whole. But yeah. the problem is there's also attack on the inside working its way out also where yeah. the different, if you're a fly fisherman over a spin fisherman, if you're a, a say a bird hunter over a deer hunter or a bear hunter, yeah. or you run dogs for animals and you know what I'm saying? And they attack one another. Like they cannot mm. band together and help one another. They want to tear each other apart. Like we're getting attacks from all sides, like just yeah. stick together guys, you know? And that's, it, it's crazy to hear that. It's, it's not just here. We don't yeah, just have it. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, yeah, that's it. It's 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 a real shame because it's yeah. If if we all club together mm -hmm. and just as one as one voice, then yeah, we I'm wouldn't have these problems. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there's there's a small part of me that actually thinks that the 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 really strong anti hunters are actually in a vast minority. They just they just shout very loudly so they get heard. Right. That's what I think. Anyway, I might be completely wrong um but that that's that's just a theory mm -hmm. um but yeah i agree that's wild well manny where can everybody find you how can they get a hold of you and follow along oh god so yeah, yeah uh i'm on instagram um on instagram i'm i'm down as fenland shikari uh, don't ask me how to spell it because I can't bloody remember. Just search it. Uh, <laughs> just search it. Just search. Just search it. Just search it. Just search it. Just so the, the and find it in his list. You yeah, yeah, that's it. So, so Fen the Fenlands is kind of like the bit of East Anglia that I live in. I'm right on the edge of the Fenlands, so um, to the back of my house, I can see hills or slight hills, um, and to the front of my house, it is flat. I mean. It's like Iowa, I suppose. It's really flat. It, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I can, I can see into two other counties 
that's how flat it is. Wow, um, yeah. So they're, they're the fens. So obviously I, I sort of thought of the name and went, well, I live in, I'm, I live in the Fenlands. I am a Shigari, so Indian for hunter. I'll go with Fenland Shigari. And I'll, I I'll like just, that. Yeah. <laughs> Very Beautiful. thought out. So I yeah, like that, that. that's, that's where people can find me. And um, yeah, and I, I, I have been quite selective as to, as to who I actually, because it is a private account for obvious reasons. Um, Agreed. Yeah, I, actually, I, I sent um, a WhatsApp to Trevor something quite, well, I found it quite comical anyway. Yes, very this, comical. Yeah, very comical. I'll, I'll quickly read it, actually. Um, there's, it's uh, crazy because you would think that, like, I personally never had, a, like, a one of those things, like the death threats or anything that these guys all talk about. But I have friends around me who constantly get messages. Yeah, yeah, it's, away. so even 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 though my account's a private account, I get sent this thing by some dude called Duck Fairy. And when I first saw the name, I thought, shit, he could be a waterfowler. Yeah, right. You know, a duck fairy. He just charms the ducks in somehow. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then he it, <laughs> he says, he says, You're you are an absolute cunt, and I hope you get cancer. Wow. I mean, just mess- what a charming, what yeah. a charming champ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what, what do you say to that? So hey, I, I just sort of. I'll give him credit because he was able to get his point across in what, six words? Yeah. You know, most yeah. people are going to write you a paragraph as to why they hate you. He just said, no, nah, yeah. here's my thought and here's what I want to happen. I appreciate you taking the time I, out of your day yeah. to just tell me that I'm that. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks. Yeah. I just, I just sort of thought, I, actually, if you if you got to meet me and got to know me, you'd think, hey, you know what? I could share a beer with this dude. Yeah. <laughs> and that's usually how it goes. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's time. it. That's it. But it's, yeah, I think it's also just, just a massive lack of education. Um, For sure. Disney hasn't helped. No. No. Disney certainly hasn't helped, but but did Disney aside, it, it I think it is just a massive lack of education. The great thing is in the UK, um, there are a few hunting, uh, shooting, and fishing organisations which take um, things to schools, right? Which is incredible. There's like, yeah, there's this big thing about angling, so fishing, um, and how obviously it's really good for mental health, and yeah, I think. I'm pretty sure in the States as well at the moment, there's, there's this whole thing about like a mental health crisis or yep. whatever. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest things that will help it is fucking getting your ass out there. Just yep. get out there, just get into the outdoors. Um, and yeah, you'll feel so much better for it. Wonderful. It's been a blast catching up with you. And it certainly just, has. Yeah. Just hearing the similarities from, our side of the world to your side of the world. And that's the same thing. Like, yeah, we have the same traditions, the same reasons, the same respects, you know, as far as even going to the old timers and sharing memories. And I mean, it's, it's all the same all the way around the world. Yeah. And you yeah. just, you don't hear that very often. Like I said, at the beginning of the show, most people's picture of how hunting is in Europe is it's a gentleman's pay to play game. You know, they don't realize there is a hunting community there. Yeah, so, yeah. It the the gentleman's pay to play is probably ten percent. Okay. And the remaining ninety is just everyday working class guys who, you know, work hard. They'll go out. They'll they'll do some pigeon shooting. They'll do wild fowling. The driven game stuff tends to be, you know, the pay to play. The, the, a yeah. bit of a privilege. Mm-hmm. Um, and some places with the deer stalking is. Uh, but on the whole, most of it is just working class guys. Beautiful. Well, we can't tell you how much it means to have you on here. It, it's it's been incredible. It's always fun to catch up with you, anyways. You know, it's yeah, always a no, good it's, time. It's so, been a pleasure being on as well. It's well, yeah, it's been good because yeah, when when I first started listening to the podcast, it's it's pretty good because sometimes like um, I might have quite long drives for work. So I'll just put a podcast on and yeah, it's, it's pretty good. And so some of the, Hey guys, how was hunt stock? When it's not yet. Up. It's not all up. August 12th. August you'll hear 12th. All about that. Yeah. We'll have all kinds of shows and stuff from there. Yeah. So yeah, we're looking forward to it. That's a very good event. And, and it being the first year, this 
he's knocking it out of the park. We are very yeah. excited to be part of nice. that. God's honest truth. If I knew about Hunt stock before I knew about DSC, I would have put that money and gone to Hunt stock. Come on, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, straight up. And you know what? I, I would have, I would have tried my damnedest to convince my buddy Nate to come as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we'll it's be gonna, doing it next year. Don't worry, it's yeah. coming and it's only going to get bigger. Let's see how the first one rolls. But we would love to have you as a guest. It would be an honor. An yeah, no, that would be good. That would be good. Be crazy. So. Well. We, we want to ask you to do us a favor. Go We're on. Gonna, you, you've cut an intro for it, but we want to hear you do the outro. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to thank everyone for taking the ride here with us all on the Outdoor Drive podcast. 